Okay, uh, good evening to good evening to all of you. Good evening to Albert, Alice, Bruce, Fran, Greg, Jerry, the Greens, Mike, Myrna, Nissan, Ron, Ruth, Stephanie, and uh, Linda and Dick. Hey everyone. I hope I caught uh, gave most of you a shout out. If I missed you, it could be that your name is not coming up on the screen. And uh, there's uh, Bruce and Sherry. That's right, Bruce and Sherry. And the Jerry and Madeline. And uh, let's, uh, all right, let's get this party started. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to learn together. And I wanted to learn a topic that in a certain sense is a continuation of a series of topics that we've been doing in the last, uh, in recent weeks. We learned the topic of Los Samaral Damriacha, which is not to stand idly by when your neighbor is in harm's way. Um, we also learned uh, the topic of Lifne Ivrlotite Mirsha, which is not to place a stumbling block in front of the blind. And that includes somebody who's spiritually blind or financially blind. And to lead a person down the wrong path, that's considered placing a stumbling block in front of that person. And um, so there's another mitzvah that appears in this same section in Parsha Kedoshim. In Parsha Kedoshim, it says that a person should strive for holiness. And then it goes on to teach us all these different interpersonal mitzvot, like v'haftalarecha kamocha, and don't speak Lashon Hara, and lo samar al damriecha, and lifnei v'loti temichshol, the mitzvah that I just said, uh, which is interesting. So that itself is teaches us a lesson. And the lesson being that if a person wants to strive for holiness in this world, you want to achieve holiness, it's thinking about the way you treat other people. And holiness doesn't mean to separate yourself from the world in a spirit of rejectionism, but rather it's to engage in the world and see how you can take those values, take your relationship with Hashem and do something kind and improve the lives of other people. So there's another mitzvah that's in this section. I like calling it, and I apologize for making this, uh, for making this statement, um, because some of you will like it, especially the basketball fans, but some of you might say, come on, why is the rabbi bringing in basketball? So I want to talk about the Scotty Pippen mitzvah. Why is this the Scotty Pippen mitzvah? Right? So if you're a basketball fan, you know, Scotty Pippen was a fantastic basketball player who was an all-star, but he really never got the respect he deserved. And, the re and he never thought that he got the respect he deserved, nor the contract that he felt he deserved. And part of the reason was because he played with the GOAT. Do you guys know what the GOAT is? GOAT stands for G-O-A-T. It's the greatest of all time. The GOAT. So that's kind of a new thing the last five, 10 years. Nissan Zucker in Brooklyn. Nissan, good to see you. Nissan, I think, is joining us from Brooklyn. So um, just to give, uh, give Brooklyn a little bit of a shout out. So GOAT is the way the kids, the millennials, describe like the greatest player of all time or the greatest rabbi of all time, right? So anyway, this Pasuk, uh, rather this mitzvah that I wanted to talk about tonight is kind of suffers a little bit from the Scotty Pippen syndrome because it appears in the same Pasuk as V'yahavtolarecha kamocha. And V'yahavtolarecha kamocha is a mitzvah that everyone knows and loves. And it's kind of a slogan that we all at least you know, that we hold dear and near to our hearts, which is to love a neighbor as yourself. But in that Pasuk, there's another mitzvah. And the mitzvah is, lotikom velotitor et b'nei amecha. V'yahavta l'reacha kamocha ani Hashem. <clears throat> so the second half of the Pasuk is, v'yahavta l'reacha kamocha. But the first half of the Pasuk sometimes doesn't get as much attention because it's overshadowed by the greatness of v'yahavta l'reacha kamocha. Another reason why it doesn't get so much attention is because it happens to be a very, very challenging mitzvah, which I thought is why it makes it an interesting topic for us to, to grapple with. What does lotikum velotitor et b'nei amecha mean? What it means is that a person, lo, lo, what is lotikum? Lotikum means a person should not take revenge. Uh, lotikum uh, is the, the, the other way to say the word is nekama, right? Nekama is to take revenge. Lotitor um, is netira, is to bear a grudge. And just to put it into a story that comes to mind is a, um, there was a particular butcher 
in New York that, uh, that, that strongly, strongly criticized Rav Moshe Feinstein, who was the Torah giant of the generation in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, until he passed away. He was the Gadol Ador. And, and the Shochet got into some, some machloket and some, some argument, meaning he, uh, you know, he criticized, strongly, harshly criticized Rav Moshe Feinstein, even though, of course, Rav Moshe didn't deserve it. He was, a, he was an incredible, humble tzaddik and Gadol Hador. Anyway, the Shochet, the butcher, needed a haskama, an endorsement from a rabbi, and he sent a letter to Rav Moshe Feinstein asking for his endorsement because he was desperate and he needed that rabbinic endorsement. And Rav Moshe Feinstein um, promptly went ahead and he wrote an endorsement, a haskama, for the Shochet. And um, so the students, the students of Ramosha said to him, wait a second, isn't that, isn't that the butcher that, uh, you know, that, that said really nasty things about you and, and he was, it was really unfair and nasty what he said about you and, and now you're writing a haskama for him? And Ramosha said something amazing. He said, that, he said that, look, in the interim, we've passed through the Yom Naraim, including Yom Kippur. And on Yom Kippur, a person, every single person does tshuva. And, uh, and I also, I go out of my way, I forgive, I forgive everyone. And, and I forgave him and presumably he did tshuva and he's a different person. So he's a reliable, reputable shochet butcher. And so I gave him an endorsement. And that's just shows the righteousness of Rav Moshe Feinstein, that he was on the level to not take revenge and to not bear a grudge upon another person. So, but this is a very, very challenging, challenging um, mitzvah. But let's see if we could learn the, let's see if we could learn the Gemara. The Gemara tries to define for us what is Nikima and what is Natira. So, in the, in the source, on the right side, the Gemara Yuma Chav Gimel Amir Aleph, it says, Ezuhi Nikima, what is considered revenge? What's considered bearing a grudge? So the Gemara says, Nikima, Amrlo Hashileni Magalecha. That's when a person says to you, you know, a person will actually you, you say to another person, you say to another person, could you lend me your hatchet? Amrlo, love, and he says, No, I would love to, but it's my policy. I don't do it. Right? I would really love to. Just I've had bad experiences. I don't want to. He says no. Lamachar the next day. Amrlo. See, so that person who didn't lend him, who didn't lend you his hatchet, he says to you, Hashilene Kardumecha, can you lend me your axe? Right. So now the roles have reversed, and he asks you to lend him something. Amrlo. And so if you say to him, Eni Mashilcha Kedero Shelo Shaltani, I'm I'm not going to lend to you, right? As payback because you didn't lend to me. Zuhi Nikima. This is, a, this is revenge. So the Gemara is giving a mundane, an intentionally mundane example as to what's considered revenge. That, uh, right, if, if you take any action against someone that's, uh, you know, that's harmful or negative in some kind of way as a, as a response to something he did to you, that's called revenge. Ezuhi Nikima. Oh no, Ve'ezehi Natira, what's considered bearing a grudge? Amrlei, Hashileni Kardumecha. Again, you ask him for the hatchet. Amrlei lo, and he says no. Lemachar, the next day, Amrlei, he shileni chalukecha. He says, can you lend me your jacket? Amrlo, and you say to him this time, in this case, you say, yes. Helach, eni kamoscha. I'm not like you. I'm better than you. You didn't lend me the hatchet. I'm going to lend you the jacket. Zuhi Natira, that's considered bearing a grudge. I believe that this is the basis or the etymology of the word, you know, of course, this is kind of the basis of the expression to bury the hatchet, right? If you get into a fight with someone, you're supposed to forgive the person and bury the hatchet. I, I believe that it could be that it's based on this passage in the Gemara that gives as the example, I mean, it could have used anything. It could have used a baseball glove, a tennis racket, a, a pot, or, or any, any number of cases, but it uses the, the, uses the example of a hatchet.
Um, let's see what it says in the chat. Okay. All right. Now this is this is very very this is very very um, uh, inter This is a very very challenging kind of mitzvah that is is really really setting a high standard for us. And there's all these different kinds of cases that you could conjure up. You know, in terms of if somebody insults you in front of other people. So you're not supposed to have emotions. You're not supposed to have feelings. You're not supposed to. Um, feel hurt and, and feel a grudge against that person. You invited that person to, to a simcha, to a family simcha, to a bar mitzvah, to a wedding. And then, they, and then they're making a wedding pre-COVID, post-COVID. There are no uh, regulations and they don't invite you. They don't invite you to the wedding. They don't invite you to their dinner party. So that's, uh, I'm a little bit uh, brigous. I'm a little bit insulted. Or let's say they really, they do something that really is hurtful to you and your family. So you just have to forgive and forget right away and you're not allowed to bear a grudge. Now, look, I understand that you're not supposed to take revenge upon the other person because that's just going to lead to a vicious cycle perhaps, but, but to not even bear a grudge, that seems to be something that's very, very challenging to achieve as human beings, as mortal human beings. Now, the Chavetz Chaim acknowledges our humanity. The Chavetz Chaim was Rabbi Israel Meir Kagan. He was known as the Chavetz Chaim because he wrote a book called Chavetz Chaim. And the book is about interpersonal relationships and specifically how we speak um, to one another and to take care in the, in, the, with, in, the, in the choice of words that we use to make sure that we're speaking in a way that just raises up others, that is kind to others. And of course, never, God forbid, brings people down or speaks Lash and Hara. So the Svar Nechonihi, the Chavetz Chaim says like this, the Be'ez Masa Hachiruf, when the person really uh, insults you, the Be'ez Masa Hachiruf, E Efshar, E Efshar B'teva Adam, it's impossible, Leo Ke'evin. A person can't be like a stone, She'en Lahovchim, Unless you're like one of the exceptional righteous ones that are really a refined character, then maybe you can kind of just let it slip off and, uh, you know, you have thick skin and you don't care about it. But 99%, maybe close to 100% of people can't be like a, a rock that doesn't have any feelings. So the Chavetz Chaim says that it's understandable for you to feel hurt. But afterwards, now that you've calmed down a little bit, and it's been a little bit of a period of time, you're not allowed to rise up and take revenge against him. That's the Pasuk Lo Tikom. That's a mitzvah. That's one of the 365 Lo Tase, negative commandments. You're not allowed to take revenge. Vafilu Rak Lintor. Asinabalev, even to harbor the grudge in your heart. Asr, that is forbidden. That is a separate mitzvah called lotitor, that you can't bear a grudge. Right? That's the that's the that's the pasuk. It says at the very top, Loti Kom Velotitor Kamocha. Back to the Chavetz Chaim, El Zman Ma'at, after a certain amount of time uh, transpires, Sarach Lishkoach Hadaver Milibo. You have to try to remove it from your heart. Now, this is really, really interesting, isn't it? And this is something that really hits home because, of course, we should always be blessed with, with, with shalom, with peace, and, um, you know, and, and harmony and good relationships. But what happens if we get into a fight, into an argument with somebody, and they do something that's really, really hurtful, then what? So, you know, now look, I think that, that we, we, all, we all want to, we all kind of deep inside want to reach a level where we forgive the person. Certainly when it comes to the time of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, then we're supposed to approach one another and, and really recognize what we might have done wrong and, and ask for forgiveness. And you're supposed to ask for forgiveness once and twice and three times. And that's the way hopefully to be Mephias, to, to reconcile with one another. During the course of the year also, not just Yom Kippur. You don't just say, I'll save it for Yom Kippur. You know, hold off. Let's wait for Yom Kippur. 
No, you're not supposed to wait to wait for Yom Kippur. You're supposed to try as soon as possible to be b'shalom, right? To be at peace with, with people. Um, shalom is the ultimate goal of, of, you know, of our relationships. We want the very last blessing of Shmona Esrei is about peace in the world, peace with other people. The very last line in the Birchat Hamazon, Hashem Oz Lamo Yitain, Hashem Yivrech Damo, Ba Shalom. The last line of the Kaddish is Ose Shalom Bim Ramav, Hashem makes peace in the heavens. He, Hashem also has to make peace in the heavens. I guess sometimes the Malachim get into, you know, step on each other's toes. And that's why it says that Hashem had to consult with the angels before he created human beings, because right, so Hashem has to create peace in the heavens, which is interesting, as if there's a problem with having peace in the heavens. And 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 so Hashem, who Shalom Aleinu. What do we do before we, we say that last line of Kaddish? We take three steps back, right? We all know that you take three steps back. Why? Because if you want to create if you want to bring peace, you have to sometimes take three steps back from your position. You have, to, you have to drop back a little bit, provide space to the other person, hear the other person's perspective, whether it's about some issue you're debating or it's about some experience that occurred to take a step back and to, to give space to the other and maybe you know, think it through and maybe try to see it from the perspective of the other. And so you gotta take three steps back sometimes to ultimately bring shalom. Having said all that, uh, we, we all want to reach that level of having shalom and forgiving one another. I think deep down, most of us want to reach that level where we don't want to take revenge and we don't want to even bear a grudge. I think it's actually very beneficial to, to forgive. There, there, may be, there may be exceptions. I, I believe there are exceptions where some things are not forgivable. Uh, Simon Wiesenthal, we'll discuss this another time in The Sunflower, the, the book of Simon Wiesenthal, it begins basically where he's by, he's by the bedside of a Nazi. And, uh, and, and the Nazi is, uh, is on his deathbed and he, and, he, and he begs for forgiveness. He says he repents from the horrible, horrible things that he did to the Jewish people. And, uh, and he asked Simon Wiesenthal for, for forgiveness. He, and he said he's repenting and he's begging for forgiveness. What did Simon Wiesenthal do when he heard that from the Nazi? He just walked out, he just walked out of the room. He didn't say, we forgive you. And he didn't say, no, we don't forgive you. He just walked out of the room. And the book, The Sunflower is, is essentially Simon Wiesenthal presenting this question to scholars and, and educators and rabbis, did he do the right thing? Very, very powerful book. And, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel tells a story as his answer. We could, we could learn about it another time. Uh, and Abraham Joshua Heschel agrees with what Simon Wiesenthal did. And he felt that Simon Wiesenthal did not, did not have to and actually did not even have the authority to, give for, to grant forgiveness to this man who had committed such evil against, against other people, right? Um, basically, um, Abraham Joshua Heschel's answer is that if, if this Nazi wants forgiveness, he has to go to the Jews who he murdered. And that, of course, is impossible in this world, certainly. And so certainly, so, so there, that's, that's getting to, we, we don't really have the Christian, you know, the Christians have this view of, you know, even if somebody commits a terrible crime, a, terror, a terrorist act or a shooting, that you no, know, that uh, that we're supposed to just forgive. We're just supposed to forgive. We don't. We don't. We we don't really believe to that extreme. Really, it's the job of the sinner. Uh, whether it's uh, the more the mundane sins that people do, but it's, if it's an egregious sin, it's the job of the sinner. The, the sinner has to be brought to justice, and 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 certainly in terms of just interpersonally forgiving, he is supposed to actually recognize what he, what he or she did wrong and supposed to approach the victim or the victim's family and, and beg for forgiveness. And again, there are some exceptions, but, you know, and certainly if it's egregious, then those might be the exceptions. But in terms of, um, and, there, and there is definitely, and there is definitely accountability. 
there is definitely, there has to be accountability. But what we're talking about, Rabbi Myrna, we're, what we're talking about is more where somebody, where somebody says something not nice to you at the Kiddush. Where somebody didn't, did not invite you to, the, to, their, to their Hanukkah party. When you always invited them. Um, when, when somebody doesn't lend you something, you know, it doesn't, doesn't help you out. Doesn't help you out in a time of need. It's a, you know, an ax, you know, who, how many people are using axes on a regular basis, but we all need help from one another. And so I think, we're, I, I think it's kind of like the small and mid-level issues that certainly the psukim we're talking about. If it's something that's a horrible thing that someone does, um, then there's certain things that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it is unforgivable because you can't turn around, you can't turn around the clock. But let's try to talk about more of these mundane examples. Most of the things that, you know, most of the things that uh, most of us get upset about during the, you know, during, during our daily lives. And the reason why we want to forgive, this is what I wanted to say before I get into anything further, which is that I think deep down we want to forgive these, these slights and insults. Why? Because if you allow the person to, if you allow the thing to remain in your mind and you harbor the grudge, you're really allowing the person to rent space in your mind without any payment. It's, it's, it's giving the person space in your mind rent-free. And we don't want to do that. And when you, it, when you forgive somebody, it's, it, there's something liberating about it, but it has to be real, has to be authentic, and it's easier said than done. And it's something that's really, really challenging. So I wanna hear your, maybe your thoughts in terms of <clears throat> how does the Torah expect us? If the Torah wants us to shake a lulav, <clears throat> so I understand the Torah wants us to shake a lulav. The Torah wants us to eat matzah. I understand that we have to do it. The Torah wants us to, uh, you know, to, to, not, uh, you know, to not do work on Shabbos. Torah wants us to make Kiddush on Shabbos, to eat kosher, to not eat trade, you know. That's something we can handle. Um, but how can the Torah expect of us to, to not bear a grudge? And what the Chavetz Chaim addresses that, the Chavetz Chaim says, okay, initially you can, you can be upset. And by the way, what that also means is that you, you should go to the person and say, you know, what you did was very hurtful. And, and, and talk about it. You're supposed to try to talk about it. You shouldn't just keep the hatred in your heart. You're supposed to, you're supposed to try to talk about it with the person to let, to know, let the person know what's bothering you and, and hopefully the person apologizes, give you a real apology. But still, whether the person apologizes or not, especially if the person doesn't apologize, I, I can't bear a grudge. So, what, but that's what the Torah requires. Isn't that interesting? Hiri, isn't that interesting? So what I wanted to talk about, I want to hear your thoughts, but I want to share at least five strategies that give us the tools to not take revenge and not bear a grudge. It's a little bit like, we you know, when it's very, very cold, you need like a bunch of different blankets. So to hear... Um, with this challenging mitzvah, it's one of the most challenging mitzvahs, I think, you need kind of like a bunch of different blankets. You need a bunch of different reasons. And I, I believe that, that all the reasons have um, a time and place and, and maybe to incorporate these ideas that I'm going to share, if you like them, to help us be successful in this mitzvah, which I think will, will strengthen our relationships, of course, lead to a restoration of relationships and, and make life much happier. Any thoughts as to what strategy we could employ to just be willing to forgive? Yeah, go ahead, Hiri. Uh, one of the biggest dilemmas that I have about this is that if as human beings, we want to emulate God, it's very, very complex. Because on one hand, uh, Hashem sets very, very strict boundaries that say, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this, you're not supposed to do this, I don't want you to do this, and so on and so forth. And if any one of us had to go by those boundaries, the punish, we would not survive the punishment. So 
Hashem introduces the concept of forgiveness so that we have a chance. But to create a balance between going by the rules and forgiveness is very, very complicated. Um, so, and then the, the forgiveness, you know, we, our, our, in our relationship to others, it's, uh, you know, you cannot, you cannot hold people to very strict standards because then we won't have any friends. And if you forgive everybody, then we'll be stepped on all over the place for, the, for, for our whole <laughs> life. So it's very complicated. <laughs> very, very good. So you got to figure out a balance between kind of like, you know, um, being, being um, I guess, holding fast to your principles and being strict about what's proper behavior Yes. And getting what you deserve or what's fair, but at the same time, some level of flexibility and forgiveness. You got to find the right balance. Very nice. Any other thoughts? Yeah, um, uh, Fr uh, Fran, go ahead. What I have used um, over the years is a common sense approach, and in the sake of harmony, in the sake of family, look away because I'm going to have to see this person at Shabbat, at a wedding, a bar mitzvah, and I'm going to feel uncomfortable. They're going to feel uncomfortable. And my saying is 50 years from now, it's not going to matter. Mm, okay. So I look so, away. Okay, so we're going to come, we're going to circle back to that idea, which I think is alluded to in the Rambam. Yes, uh, I think uh, that, is that dad or, or, or is that, oh, okay. I thought that was, okay, no, no. Oh, is that... That's that's my mother-in-law and father-in-law. They're Ruth and Ruth and Simon. Hi, hi, mom and dad. Did you want to say something, or I just, uh, or I thought I saw your hand? Okay, Ron, go ahead. My problem with the verse is it says loti kom veloti toiz neamcha. Your own people. What happens if it's a goy? That's number one. Number two, the, the verse ends with ani adonai because I'm watching you basically. That's that's what the verse says. So be careful with what you're doing because I you're gonna have to answer to me. But what if it's not Neamcha? What if it's somebody else? That's number one. And the other quick thing is, the, the, with all due respect, Hashileniet Magalcha is actually, those are very two important instruments. Magalcha is actually a sickle. Because in Bible time, you know, it comes from the word Magal, which is a circle, the sickle to cut the sheaves of the wheat. And the other one, Kardumcha, is actually the axe, because uh, even Hillel used to actually cut wood for fireplace for people for heat, you know. So these are very two, they chose the instrument for a reason, you know. But what if it's not your people? What do you do? If it's a goy, for example, do you treat them the same way? Yeah, I, I think there's a higher level of obligation to family. And when we say family, all Jews are part of the extended family. But there, but yes, but this, this mitzvah, whether it's technical or not, I think it also applies to non-Jews as well. Right. Because because all human beings are, of course, created in the, in the image of God and endowed with divine dignity and should be treated accordingly. And so I, I believe, yes, higher level, higher standard of responsibility we always have to the Jewish people, but that we do have this, I think with this kind of mitzvah, you know, the Rambam says that, that, that just like there's a mitzvah to do chesed and bury the dead of, of a Jew, so too you're supposed to help bury the dead of the non-Jew, you're supposed to give them tzedakah, you're supposed to do bikr cholim, and so, and there's a mitzvah of tzedakah, generally. So and that's Jews, why it ends with well the word. Jews. And so here also, yeah. here also, I think, I think it would apply uh, to non-Jews as well. It says, uh, I need other, Albert, Albert, the Albert go ahead, Albert. Right. First of all, I bear a grudge for Erie. He looks too comfortable lying down on that couch. Erie, you heard that? Say it again, Albert. No, it's okay. I didn't get a laugh the first time. Um, <laughs> Here, here he, Albert said you look too comfortable on the couch there. There, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, you know, if, if the idea is to create a um, you know, relationship between people, you, you asked about strategies. It's, I think it's important to listen to what somebody's holding. A, somebody says, for example, no to the request on an ax. Listening, there must have been something in that person's history or past or something that's current that's bothering that person. Simply to turn your back and say, okay, now I, the next time you ask me for something, I'm not going to give it to you, doesn't create that narrative between people. 
if you listen, if you try to understand, that's what creates the bridge and the narrative between people that can potentiate, you know, all of us to be better people. So a strategy is, you know, for, for a shortcut, it's just listen. You know, we have, we have two ears and one mouth. We should use them in the same ratio. Phenomenal. Very, very well put, Albert. That's, that's great. That's great. Uh, and I think, I think that's one, while, while Fran was, was hinting to the Rambam, um, your, your allude, I think that was, that was beautifully put in terms of listening. I like that in terms of, what did you say, two ears and, and one mouth. So that's ratio to keep in mind. And the importance of listening to see what might be the context of it and where the person might be coming from and to, to listen and read between the lines as well. It's, it's really beautiful. Yes, Madeline. Uh, yes, I, I sent a message in the chat, but just to reiterate, um, I don't know how many years ago, 20, 25 years ago, I read Rabbi Zelig Pliskin's book, Gateway to Happiness. And he kept reiterating that the things that worry us so much and that we hold grudges for, et cetera, et cetera, in the big picture of things is just so ridiculous and so insignificant that we need to actually assess it, you know, it was something that seems so huge to us, you know, so painful. If we stop to think about it and put it in the proper perspective, we, we can then learn to see that it's just not worth the effort. It just doesn't, you know, it's, it has no value really, or very little value. Okay, so Madeline, you also, you just kind of uh, elaborated on and shared something along the lines of what Fran said. And I see from Myrna's, uh, Myrna's comment, that Myrna's comment, uh, please read that in the chat box. I think that kind of um, is along the lines of what Albert was, was just sharing. And so if we take a look at the Rambam in source number, I'm jumping now because this is what Madeline, uh, you were just saying, what Fran was saying. He says that a person is not supposed to uh, take revenge. He says, you see in the third line, I'm highlighting it there, this is the Rambam in Hilcho Deo Zion Zion 7 7. He says that a person should be maver al midosa, a person should be very forgiving. And parenthetically, the Gemara in Erevin, page 13, says that the reason why we follow Beit Hillel over Beit Shammai is for, is for two reasons. In a different passage of the Gemara, it says because there were more followers of Beit Hillel, but in this passage in Erevin, it says number one, because they articulated the arguments of Beit Shammai before presenting their own. They, they wanted to listen to hear where the other person was coming from, which was Albert, what you were saying. But secondly, the other reason why we follow Beit Hillel is because they were Mavre al Midosa. They were easygoing, they were forgiving, they didn't take themselves too seriously. The Rambam similarly says, you should kind of be forgiving, easygoing. I'll call Divri, of course you're, you're strong with your convictions. And, and our actions and words and decisions matter. And we care about things. But if it's something where we're slighted and uh, in, in, in some kind of way, that's where a person should be easygoing and forgiving. Why? I'll call Devei Olam. Listen, look at his words. Shehakol Eitzel HaMevinim. Everything for those who are really intelligent, everything is Devei Hevel Vahavai. Everything is is vanity and trivial, and it's not worth taking vengeance for them. The way my father put it was, I don't sweat the small stuff, and most of the things that bother us are small stuff. Now, there are certain things that are not small stuff, right? And, but at least the Rambam is talking about most of the things, and the clay yucker, Rav Shlomo Ephraim Lunches gives us an example. He says that if you have kids who are playing Lego, and one kid knocks over the other, kid's Lego, uh, Lego castle. So the kid runs over to the parent and says, oh, he, he knocked down my Lego castle. And for that child, it is very important and it is a big deal. But we kind of know in the big scheme of things, you know, the, the little Lego thing, still it was wrong for the child to do that. And, and, and some lesson, you know, the, the parent of that child or the friend of the person should kind of point out to the person or the, the parent should point out to the child in the Lego example, you know, that you shouldn't uh, touch another person's uh, toys and, 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 and break, break their things. But 
just like we understand that a Lego castle is, is something that's really relatively meaningless in the scheme of things, so too most of the things that we get upset about are really in the cosmic picture of things are really not worth getting upset about. So that's the, that's the Rambam. I, I call that the theory of relativity. Another reason, because it's relative, it's not, relatively speaking, it's not important, the theory of relativity. Uh, of course, not Einstein's theory of relativity, but it's Kalman Topp's uh, way to describe one explanation is the theory of relativity. The other idea, I'm going to say it like this, that it's to be down the kaf's Again, I want to give you five strategies. The first one was actually going to be, it was, I had it as my fifth one. These are not an order of importance, it's just five. And I just did the fifth first because Madeline and, and Fran I mentioned, uh, Madeline and, um, and Fran mentioned that. The idea that Albert and, and Myrna were highlighting, I think each in their own way, is along the lines of that we, we should give the person the benefit of the doubt. It means don't rush to judge the person. I, I, I guess I'm saying it in a different way, but that, that the first, that a reason why it's wrong to take revenge and to bear a grudge is really in a certain sense judicial, right? that if a person says no to you and doesn't want to lend, lend something to you or does something that seems to be hurtful, to take revenge and to bear a grudge means you've, you've, been, you've, you've already been like a judge and a jury and, and you've determined that it was absolutely wrong and horrible and outrageous that the person did this. And the mission in Avot says, have done et kol ha'adam lekafshut. You should judge every single person and give him or her the benefit of the doubt. And it says ha'adam, the entirety of the person. And I once read in one of the commentaries that that because a person is a, you know, there is a complex personality, and there are things that might have happened that day or that week, or that the person is going through, that is kind of provides context to to what happened. Rav Amital, my Rebbe uh, at Yeshiva Haratzion, once pointed out that we, when we judge ourselves. We tend to be lenient. You know, yeah, I wasn't, um, I made a mistake, but, uh, but overall, I'm a good guy. Oh, uh, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I acknowledge that. But, you know, overall, I'm a decent, you know, overall, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a great guy. But when, so when we judge ourselves, we tend to be lenient, right? But when we judge others, then we rule very stringently, right? If we see him do one thing wrong, or if he insults me, I view him as like the, the lowest low life. I mean, this is such a bum. How could he do such a thing? And what Rav Amital is suggesting is that really it should be the other way around. That we should try to be lenient and forgiving with other people. And we should be a bit more stringent upon ourselves. Another idea, another idea, which is, it's not such an exciting idea, which is really more the idea of intrinsic. That that a person should do the right thing unconditionally. You should do the right thing um, for other people, whether or not they treated you in a way that deserves such treatment. Um, meaning that you should, be, you should be kind to him and lend him something and talk to him kindly, even if they might not deserve it because of something they did to you uh, previously. Rabbi Lazar Mimetz in his Sefi Yireim, uh, seems to highlight that idea, which is that you have a responsibility to do what's right. Uh, and it doesn't make a difference what the person might have done to you. The Yerushalmi has a very beautiful answer, which is the fourth idea. So the first idea we said is the don't sweat the small stuff and most things are small stuff. Number two, which is that you have to listen to the other person. See where they're coming from. Recognize that, the uh, you know, you know, that, uh, that there may be another side to it. And I'm saying it as giving the person the benefit of the doubt. The third idea is intrinsic. You know, it's obligation to do what's right and to be kind and to be, and to be nice. The fourth idea is mentioned by the Yerushalmi. It's really, really interesting. And it's the idea that we're all in this together. We've heard this many, many times during days of COVID. Um, we're definitely in this storm together. I think everyone's in a different ship in the storm based on their personality, based on their circumstances, based on whether they or a family member have been stricken with the, with the illness and 
God forbid, if there's a death in the family, you know, so every, everyone's in a different, in a different ship, but in a certain sense, we're in the storm together. So the, the Yushalmi in the Dharim says, gives an interesting example. Hey, look at the English. You're welcome. In source number five, you see in the small, the small letters down at the bottom of the page, I highlighted, I highlighted some of it there. How can not taking vengeance and bearing a grudge be achieved? This is the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud asked the question. And because the rabbis of that generation also were bothered, how can you achieve this? Gives a great, gives a great analogy. It says, if a man was cutting meat and the knife entered his hand, meaning he cut his hand by accident, would the injured hand retaliate by cutting the other hand? And what, 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 that, is, what that is teaching us, it's an amazing thing is, right, that uh, the Jewish people are considered like one body. And if there's one Jew that's harmed in the, one of the far-flung places of the world, so then that's something that bothers us because the Jewish people, all generations, past, present, and future, vertically, but also the Jewish people horizontally are all part of one body. Now that's easier said than done, no doubt, but this is just, again, a blanket, right? A blanket for the cold. It's one of the five blankets. Um, and here the Yushalmi's take on it is nationalistic. Is how can you take revenge on your other hand? How could you possibly think of taking revenge on your brother, on your sister? You might be upset, you might be upset but okay, so work it out, work it out. Don't take revenge and don't bear a grudge, work it out and try to reach a level where you could, where you could be on good terms once again. The fifth idea that I had, and I'm happy again to hear any other thoughts that you have, is theological. Is theological. The Sefer Achinuch says basically that everything that happens in this world happens for a reason, and and it's all part of God's plan, whether we understand it or not. So the Sefer Achinuch says, and we know, I mean, look, if, 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 if there would be no God, then, then the world is haphazard and there's no purpose to anything. We believe there is a God to the world, of course, and therefore there is a purpose for the world and every single pers per person has a purpose within the world. And so things happen for a reason. And look at what the Sefer Achinuch says. Let's take a look at the, at the English. It says like this, man should impress upon himself the fact that all that happens to him, good or bad, is from God. Nothing inflicted on him by his fellow can happen in defiance of the will of God. Therefore, when he suffers insult or hurt, he should realize that his own iniquities are responsible and God decreed thus. He should not turn his thoughts to taking vengeance from him or even bearing a grudge, I would say, since the latter is not the cause of his misfortune. His own iniquity is the ultimate cause. As David said, let him curse since God has told him. He attributed the situation to his own sin and not to Shimi, the son of Gera, who is, who is cursing him. This commandment is greatly beneficial in removing dissension and eradicating hatred from men's heart. Right? When he suffers insult or hurt, he should realize that it's not all about what this person did to you, but really it's about working on yourself. Now, the way the Sefer, the the Sefer Achinuch says it, you know, is a, is a little bit black on white, a little bit doesn't, some of it, you know, maybe doesn't resonate with the modern ear, but if we could kind of like massage it and soften it a little bit, we don't know, we don't know exactly why things happen. If something bad happens, if a person suffers illness, God forbid, the Gemara makes it clear that we don't, that it's not, it's not necessarily due to, it's not necessarily due to something that you did wrong. It's not necessarily a response to a sin that you committed. We don't know exactly why things happen. With, with COVID, the pandemic, we, we, don't, we don't know the reason why it's happened. We have to try to, to do our best to get through it, to grow through it, to appreciate the blessings. We don't know why it's happening, but as Jews, what we do, what we do, to respond, whether it's COVID, whether it's uh, going through a, a challenging time, 
is that we do try to improve ourselves during that situation. We don't know why it's happening, uh, but we do try to, you know, pick it up a notch and, uh, you know, to better ourselves because, you know, you know, that could be part of the reason. And in any case, taking upon yourself a greater commitment in mitzvot is going to be a source of merit for you. But so whether it's something that happened because you did something wrong, or is it just the things that we go through in life are, are, meant, for, are meant for a reason. And so if, some, if someone does something that's, that's, um, that's hurtful to you, if you say that it's all about, that this person did this to me and it was, it's, it's only because of him that I'm, that I'm suffering this embarrassment. It's all because of what he did. And, and, and really I'm not deserving it of it all. And had it not been for, for his foolish, egotistical behavior, um, I would not have suffered in this situation. You know, if you're going to say it that way, then of course you're going to bear a grudge upon that person. However, if you recognize that, you know what, that every single person, every single one of us, we go through an experience for a reason. And, and, we, and when things happen in our lives, whether it's through nature, whether it's illness, whether it's a, a personal challenge of some kind, or whether it's sometimes where somebody does something to us that is hurtful, that is... That is intended for us to grow through that experience. I want to make it clear that this is not acquitting or vindicating the person who did something wrong to you. He or she who did something wrong, it was wrong what they did and they shouldn't have done it. And they're going to be, you know, they're going to be held accountable in some kind of way for it. And the truth is, it's going to, they, right, they're, gonna, they're not going to have, um, you know, as many positive relationships if that's the way they act with people. So they're gonna just be harm, harming themselves, but they're gonna be held accountable. But in terms of why it happened to you, so it happened for a reason. So the Sefer Achinuk says that if you, if that's, if, you have a, if you have faith in Hashem that things happen for a reason, um, then it still wasn't right what he did. And, um, and that doesn't mean I ever have to be best friends with that guy because I don't want to make myself vulnerable to be hurt again. But you know what? You know what? I, I realized that, um, again, it's giving him the benefit of the doubt. I have to try to do the right thing in any case. There's a good chance it's small stuff. We're all part of one. We're all part of one nation. We're part of one people. We're part of one family. We're part of one body. But also, you know what? You know what? Maybe there's a reason why I had to go through this and I can get stronger from it. And if you look at it in that way, that's, a, that's maybe a tool, it's a strategy, and, it's, and, it's, and there's truth to it as well, to be able to forgive the person. It's an amazing story with uh, the Beis HaLevi. He was once in, sitting in the study hall, and a man walked in and started, and started, screaming, started screaming at him. That you don't know, you don't, that you're, you, you call yourself a rabbi, but you don't know the first thing about, about Talmud and the Torah. And you, you, the person, the Beis Halevi had judged against him in a based in case. And the person was obviously very, very upset. And he was, he, he like was criticizing the Beis Halevi in front of the whole Beit Medrash. And later that day, the, the, this, the man was working in the field and he was, he was killed by one of his animals. Oh, I, I left out a, I left out a, well, I'll, 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 I'll say it later. So the person was in the field and he was killed by one of his animals. I don't know, one of his, uh, I don't know, the horse, the bull um, killed this man. And the word came back to the base Halevi that this man who had embarrassed him in front of the whole house, uh, yeshiva had, had, been, had died. The base Halevi did not say, you know, did not feel good about it. He did not say, oh yeah, I told you and I told you so in terms of, uh, you know, he had it coming. But, but he ran over to the house of his son, Reb Chaim. And he, and he said to Reb Chaim, Reb Chaim was there earlier in the base Medrash. And he said, he said Reb Chaim, he said to his son, Chaim, um, after the person left, didn't you hear what I said? I said, Ani I forgive you. Ani I forgive you. 
the Beit HaLevi, after the guy screamed at him in the yeshiva, the Beit HaLevi said, said, I, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. He, because he obviously was on such a high level that uh, he was able to somehow incorporate these different perspectives. And he says, I forgive you, I forgive you. And the, when, when Beit HaLevi heard that this guy was killed, and it could very well be that he was killed because he embarrassed, you know, this, this great tzaddik. Uh, we don't know exactly why he was, why he was killed by one of his animals, but the Beit HaLevi was so, um, was so distraught. He was so um, upset about it that he ran over to Reb Chaim and he said, and he made him swear that he said that I forgive him. In other words, he didn't want to be responsible. He, he, he wanted to make sure that he wasn't responsible for this guy's death. And, and Reb Chaim said yes to his father, that yes, you said that you forgive him and you said it, you, you said it sincerely and, and you shouldn't feel guilty about what happened until Reb Chaim learned the Shnayas in memory of this person. And, and he said Kaddish on his yard site, I'm not sure, every year or, the, or, or for a couple of years, uh, just to show you just that level, again, another story where, Rav, where the Beis Halevi, the great grandfather of Rabbi Joseph Salavechik, the Beis Halevi, who was also Rabbi Yosef Dov Halevi Salavechik. Um, that's the Beis Halevi, wrote a, wrote a sefer called Beis Halevi. So um, that he was someone who was on that level who was able to, to, not, to not bear a grudge upon this person. And even when he heard that the person was killed, he was not happy. He was not happy about it at all, but rather um, he was very, very distraught about it. And I, I think to touch on what, what was also mentioned earlier to end, which is that, that the more we're able to be forgiving, not only will it be good for us to be happier, but if we're forgiving of others, then we hope that Hashem will be forgiving of us. And, and because in a certain sense, Hashem treats us the way we treat others. And... Um, you know, and the more we, we maybe go above and beyond to be forgiving to other people, then maybe other people will go above and beyond with us and Hashem will go above and beyond in showing mercy to us and, and, and be forgiving of anything we do wrong and treat us, right? And, and, and show us mercy in, and give us blessing. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, um, the, the building of the Mishkan, right? The Mishkan was after the sin of the golden calf. And the, the sukkah, the sukkah is the clouds of glory. The clouds of glory return to the Jewish people after Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with the second luchot. And what that shows is that even after, right, Moshe comes down with the first luchot and he breaks the tablets. There's a breaking of the relationship. It's almost like an unforgivable sin that's committed by the Jewish people. But there's 40 days of prayer, and there's 40 days where Moshe goes back up on Har Sinai and he comes back down with, with, a, with the second tablets uh, representing the restoration of the relationship between Hashem and B'nai Yisrael. And Moshe Rabbeinu brings down to B'nai Yisrael a message of forgiveness. And, and then the clouds of glory return. The clouds of glory return. And I think that's, an, that's a very, very powerful lesson. I think that if you're, if you're in a fight with a family member, or you're in a fight with a friend and it's something that's recent or something that's uh, happened years ago to, you know, that there's that past, there's a capacity of a restoration of relationship that, that maybe if you go above and beyond and you reach out to that person, who knows, maybe you can have a restoration of the clouds of glory. If we could kind of like take away the hatred from our heart or the resentment in our heart, maybe the person's not deserving of it. But if we can fulfill this mitzvah, to not take revenge and to not bear a grudge. And if we're able to utilize these strategies, it'll make us happier. Who knows, maybe it'll serve as a merit for us. And, and you never know, never know, it might lead to a restoration of, of a meaningful relationship. Should, should all be good people. Dan al Kavzachut at Kol Hachraim. That, that encapsulates it, Alice. That's right. We should all be good people and be Dan al Kavzachut. Very good. Thank you all so much. Thank you. you guys are great. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank